everyone. I'm going to start the broadcast just because it's not showing up that anyone has signed in yet. So I'm going to see if starting it has uh, something to do with it. Oh. Yep, that seemed to do the trick. All right, John and Dimitris, we have about uh, 13 people who have signed in already, so we're, I think, 65 registered, so I'm going to go ahead and start the broadcast, and hopefully more will trickle in. Um, you all, if you could mute yourselves uh, while I talk, that'd be great. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hi everyone, this is Megan Houston with the Institute for Market Transformation. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to begin the, the, the presentation today and then I'll be followed by John Brayman with Bright Power and then Dimitris Kapsis with American Utility Management. We are going to mute all of the audience members, so if you do have a question, please use the chat box to type it in and we'll have a Q&A at the very end of the webinar where we'll answer your questions. So with that, I'd like to begin by, um, as I mentioned, I'm with the Institute for Market Transformation. I lead the multifamily work here at IMT, and I'm here to talk about findings from our recent report called Catalyzing Efficiency, Unlocking Energy Information and Value in Apartment Buildings. This report looks at how building owners and managers can take advantage of all this energy and benchmarking data out there and how it's transforming or whether it's transforming the multifamily sector. Before starting into the findings from the report, I'd just like to give a big shout out to the MacArthur Foundation for supporting our work. And we, uh, we, they're very gracious in how they are funding us, so we appreciate them very much. First, I'm going to begin with a little bit of background on why IMT focuses on buildings and energy efficiency in the building sector and why buildings matter to us. As you can see, the buildings account for a huge significant amount of carbon emissions and energy compared to countries as well as across sectors within the United States. It's the single largest energy user in the United States and we spend about $400 billion every year as Americans on heating and cooling and power in the places that we live and work. We're also looking at why apartments matter. So there are nearly 19 million households and 39 million residents who rent in these five plus unit buildings, which we call multifamily apartments. 
and you can see that about half of these residents pay more than 30 percent of their income on housing which means it's really not affordable for those particular people and there's also a huge disparity in within the sector um, so that percentage-wise one study found that low-income households pay twice as much of their income on utilities as do median households and this is um, you know besides rent utilities is a significant expense so if we can cut down that for the residents we help improve their quality of life and also and can improve their energy efficiency overall so the core work that IMT supports with um, energy efficiency policies is the benchmarking and transparency of a building's energy use. By benchmarking, we're talking about measuring the building's energy use and comparing it to itself or its portfolio or other um, similar sim situated bu buildings and looking at how is it doing, how is it performing, what's the trends. This allows owners and occupants to understand how that building's doing. It helps off identify ways to cut waste, and it also is a signal to the market that provides information so the market can understand how that building is performing. And by getting this information into the market, we see this continuous cycle of improvement and demand for high-performing buildings. In 2012, IMT looked at how these benchmarking and transparency policies were affecting or would affect the multifamily sector. But back then, this was a time where only a handful of policies were actually in place that applied to multifamily buildings. So basically, stakeholders didn't have access to the data they needed to use in everyday transactions. Since that 2012 report, we now have a much more colorful landscape showing where multifamily um, building benchmarking policies have been adopted with 12 cities and the state of California now having such policies. And uh, Portland, Maine was the most recent city to enact its multifamily policy a few weeks ago. Because of all this change and this po these policies that were pushing the data into the market, IMT set out to ask whether and how this is having an impact on multifamily stakeholders, on the multifamily building sector, focusing on rental units, and to see how is it changing this market? What we found is that the data, the impact from that data is just beginning to have an impact. There are still a lot of challenges and opportunities to further use this information to transform the multifamily building sector into a more efficient building stock. So this report and this, um, this webinar today is going to look at how owners and managers can work together to use building performance data to unlock vast savings through energy efficiency. This here is a diagram of what an ideal market would be in terms of how benchmarking information is shared across these key stakeholders. So at the very bottom is the owner and manager bubble. This is the group that has, of course, the greatest influence over how actually buildings are performing over doing retrofits and implementing measures to save energy efficiency and ideally lived, uh, lead to this continuous building improvement process. They also share their data with different stakeholders, the governments and energy efficiency program implementers on the top left have a relationship where they are collecting data from the owners and managers. They're also turning it around and publishing that data and then creating programs to help owners and managers actually act on that data. Over on the top right, we also have the residents, the lenders, the investors sector, and this group, they um, ideally would, out of self-interest, they would use this building performance information and in their everyday transactions in a way that benefits themselves, and by doing that, it would lead to them demanding energy efficiency. This would in turn motivate owners and managers to further implement efficiency actions and invest to attract those residents, lenders, and investors. And ideally, all of this would work together where it would lead to owners and residents saving billions of dollars in efficiency. However, as we found through our research and talking to the different stakeholders, 
there are a lot of um, barriers to how this flow of information is happening. And we're going to talk about some of those today. Here we look at an idea how um, in this ideal market, owners and managers would use benchmarking and building performance data to act upon that information. So they would, um, as we mentioned, compare their portfolio to peers or incorporate this efficiency into business as usual. And what this list of actions shows is that Benchmarking data is really just the first step for owners and managers to continuously improve their building performance. It's, um, it's not necessarily the, the end game here. A big misconception about what benchmarking data is that we found when talking to owners and managers is that it tells, an own, it tells them what to do. And this is very frustrating to go through this process, hire a full-time employee to benchmark all the properties, and then not quite find your value in that process. What this really highlights is making the connection for owners from going to benchmarking to energy and water improvement is key. We know that some owners and managers are taking this information to the next le level and they are um, requiring their properties to enroll in energy service provider um, software and benchmark their units. They're also meeting with their asset managers on a quarterly basis to review this information or making sure their management team has it throughout their data so that they're, they're starting to incorporate it into their everyday transactions. However, a lot of other owners and managers, especially in the affordable housing sector, especially small and mid-sized building owners, have trouble with taking data into act and with turning data into action. Fortunately, there are resources out there, so governments and efficiency program implementers are using building performance data to create programs that drive action and offer resources to different multifamily stakeholders out there. For example, Cambridge Energy Alliance is using benchmarking data to target outreach and then connect its multifamily owners with the Mass Save program. Similarly, in New York, the Retrofit Accelerator is taking insights from its benchmarking and energy audit laws, and then they're offering technical assistance to do these energy and water efficiency improvements. Additionally, uh, these building owners, or many building owners, will work with energy service providers to contract for these types of services, and these include uh, Bright Power and American Utility Management, who will speak more today about the services that they provide. Also, of the there are, as I mentioned, 12 cities with multifamily benchmarking policies. Many of these, along with other cities, provide resources for owners and managers to really lower that burden, that initial burden for um, analyzing the data and deciding what to do to eventually improve energy and water performance. And sometimes they'll even subsidize or provide free third-party energy management services. For example, um, Chicago's Energy Savers Program and Massachusetts Low-Income Multifamily Energy Retrofits Program have both subsidized um, Bright Power and WeGoWise services to different to qualified owners. And currently, Benchmark Connecticut is offering we go wise to multifamily building owners with five plus units. So the point here is that owners and managers, especially those who are new to the field, who are new to acting on, you know, deciding what to do with this information, should take advantage of what these governments, these implementers, these service providers are offering. I'd also like to highlight some of the the lender products out there where they are now looking more at building performance data, they're asking for benchmarking data, and they're also incentivizing owners to act on this data by implementing energy efficiency measures and providing loan proceeds for that. So the first, Fannie Mae has its green initiative, and within that they have the Green Preservation Plus program, which is strictly for affordable buildings, and they also have green rewards which is for market rate and affordable. Both of these require an ASHRAE level two energy audit and benchmarking. The benefit to the owner is that 
there are lower interest rates and additional proceeds that the owners can get. And most recently, Fannie Mae announced that it would even pay for the high performance building report, which comprises that um, energy audit and benchmarking uh, requirements. Similarly, Freddie Mac has its multifamily green advantage program that offers better pricing and more proceeds for efficiency improvements. And like Fannie Mae, you have to do an ASHRAE level one or a level two audit depending on the program that you want to choose. This also requires benchmarking and they'll reimburse up to $3,500 of that, of those energy assessment costs. They'll also give you a rebate, a $5,000 rebate on new property loans if you have an Energy Star score. Doesn't matter what the score is, just if you have it, if you've done your benchmarking, you get the rebate. And finally, HUD will, um, they've announced that they will reduce mortgage insurance premiums for having an Energy Star score of at least 75. So here you have to benchmark and show that you're about um, 75 or greater, and then you can expect to see about 3 to 5 percent in additional loan proceeds. And just to wrap it up, um, this is a four-part webinar series. We'll have one more webinar that's focused on lenders and investors with IMT and Community Preservation Corporation. We're also writing a series of blogs about each of the webinars, and we'll be um, attending panels and presentations throughout the next six months or so. And you can also go to um, the blog post to see past recordings from different webinars. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bright Power. Great. Thanks so much, Megan. This is John Bremen with Bright Power. I'll get my screen up here being shared. I think my screen should be shared now. <laughs> Let me know if that's not coming through, Megan. Um, but really happy to be part of this webinar. Um, Bright Power, um, as Megan mentioned, we, we do a lot of benchmarking for um, affordable housing. It's, it's part of um, a suite of energy and water management services that we offer. And, and I think this report um, that IMT has put together is really um, does a great job of um, highlighting many different ways that um, owners Many of them are, are already using benchmarking data to catalyze action, and hopefully this will, will spur many others to start making that jump. Um, there's a graphic on the slide here that um, we, we use a lot. It's kind of a, a, a little slogan around here, uh, find, fix, and follow. And I think um, you'll see that theme throughout my slides. Uh, you know, benchmarking um, helps find opportunities or find problems, but then it usually takes some other type of action to actually fix them and make the buildings better. Um, and then benchmarking, again, comes in handy once you, once you do some kind of fix or upgrade to follow and watch and see if things are working out the way you expect. So we think of this as an ongoing process. Um, benchmarking is not a, a quick fix. <laughs> it's not like a pill you take and suddenly your buildings are, are much better and your expenses are lower. It's, it's much more of a, a long-term habit. Um, you know, I use the analogy of, of keeping fit and eating well. Um, it, it's a long-term type of thing, not a, a one-time fix. And I think that's important for everyone to keep in mind um, when there are new policies being rolled out. It's, it's not it's going to work the first time, so to speak, but it's going to take, take time uh, for the value of the data to really come through in the actions that building owners and property managers are taking. Um, I, can't, I can't pretend that collecting and analyzing utility data is always fun. Uh, it's not most people's idea of a good time. There are some folks in my office here who actually enjoy it a lot, but we understand that's not <laughs> the, normal, uh, the normal opinion of it. And look, it's a hassle. Um, for some buildings, it's going to be uh, much easier than others. Uh, if you have a, a high-rise multifamily building that's master metered, so the owner is paying all the utility bills for the property, um, or it's in a, a utility that already provides aggregate building data, it's not too hard to do. If, it, if you have a garden style complex where you might have hundreds of units in dozens of buildings and each little building has separate utility accounts, even just collecting the owner data can be pretty time consuming. Um, so we know that. We're, we're in the thick of fighting through that, that data collection challenge with our clients and have been for years. Um, but the good news is that things are improving. There are more, building, more utilities 
that are offering whole building data, um, more utilities that even if they don't have whole building data, they provide easy online access through uh, websites or spreadsheets that you can download with the utility data. There's more service providers um, such as us and, and AUM, who you hear from shortly, and, and many others that are ready to help. Um, and there are resources, and Megan did a good job showing uh, several of them uh, in her slides. Um, but of course, the data is not the point. The data is a way to catalyze action and to guide actions to make buildings better. So um, I'm going to go through just a, a few examples from uh, building owners that we work with, and I've, I've stolen some of these little bubbles from the uh, IMT's report that um, I think do a great job of, of outlining several types of actions uh, that folks can take using benchmarking data. Um, the first one is to set policies and goals that are consistent throughout the portfolio. Um, there's a lot of ways that, that this, I think, can be used. Um, the example that I'm going to show here is a affordable housing nonprofit um, that has a portfolio of uh, properties, actually several different parts of the country, um, some northeast, some uh, Texas, Midwest, and we're tracking them in our energy scorecards tool um, and working with them generally. What, what you're looking at here is a, uh, a graph that ranks the properties going back a couple years. Um, each bar is a property. They're being ranked by the uh, water use in gallons per bedroom per day, which is sort of a, a water efficiency uh, index that we use. And um, the ones that are yellow are properties that they highlighted and decided they were going to take some action on. They were going to do some water projects. Um, you can also see the target that they set. So, you know, once we benchmarked the portfolio, we, we talked with them and, and figured out what what we all thought was a reasonable target of 75 gallons per bedroom per day that they were going to shoot for uh, across the portfolio. Um, a couple years later, things have, have evolved. Um, you know, for one thing, you can see that they now have more properties. So they've been acquiring properties, uh, and there are some that, you know, we took a little while to, to get up and, and running tracking. Um, you can see I've, I've circled, um, put little boxes around a couple of these properties. Uh, if actually, I should have pointed that out on the previous slide. Um, these two over here that were up at, you know, over 100 and over 150 gallons per bedroom per day um, were brought down to below 75, so below that target. So that's some good success. Things are moving in the right direction. Um, one of the properties up here actually had what we call creep in that the consumption has actually crept up. So, you know, we're in the process now of figuring out what's going on there and helping them address it. Um, but I think it's an example, you, you can see that it's a process and setting that standard, that target of 75 gallons per bedroom per day doesn't magically make all the properties improve, but gives you something to shoot for and, and it takes time to, to gradually move, move the portfolio toward that target. The next action um, that I'll tell a little story about is uh, prioritizing efficiency projects uh, in properties that have the highest need and the highest return. Um, and this is a really core use for benchmarking data um, that you can use in m many different ways. So I'll show a couple examples here. Um, and these, by the way, some of these screenshots are from our Energy Scorecards tool, which is uh, Bright Power's uh, benchmarking platform. Um, and we, we think of as sort of the foundation of good energy and water management. Um, again, we're looking here at water use uh, gallons per bedroom per day. The blue dots are ranking the properties in this portfolio um, by their, their water efficiency. The orange bars are showing how much they're spending on water at each property. And it's just a gross spending number. So this big, tall orange bar, bar here is a very large property. Um, and it's sort of the middle of the road in terms of efficiency. But in thinking about where the highest return might come from a water project in this portfolio, it was an obvious candidate because even if you could remove, you know, bring the water usage down a few percent there, you're going to save a lot because it's such a big property. Um, it's getting a C grade in our energy scorecard system, which means it's a little bit worse than average compared to our larger database of uh, over 22,000 multifamily properties around the country that, that we're tracking. Um, so find an opportunity where there seems like good potential. Um, we then want to track any improvements that happen. So they, they did really a, a, a retrofit here focused on repairing toilets, which seemed to be the big problem there. Um, initial results are good. This is a, another page where we're looking at um, 
kind of year over year water consumption. The retrofit was completed just this past June. Um, and for the last four months, you can see clear uh, decrease compared to the previous year. Um, there's some dollars uh, calculations down below to show the payback um, based on the cost and the, and the current water and sewer rates uh, at this location. And this is a really cost-effective project. It's going to pay back in, in well under a year. They don't all pay back that fast, but the, the important message here is if you didn't have the data, you wouldn't know whether it was working. And so you can find the opportunity and then uh, make sure that it's actually paying off the way you expect it to. Um, one question that we spend a lot of time thinking about is how do we find the best opportunities using benchmarking data? Um, and so, you know, you probably heard Portfolio Manager has their 1 to 100 score. Um, in Energy Scorecards, we do our own version of that where we have grades that are A, B, C, D grades. Um, our goal, um, which is, you know, similar in intent to Portfolio Manager's uh, score, even though we have our own, our own methodology, is to correct for the permanent features. So, you know, we don't want to give a building a bad grade just because it's of a certain age or in a certain location. Um, but we want to make the grade based on fixable features or behavioral operational uh, characteristics that, that are things that the owner can have the opportunity and the ability to, to adjust. Um, so you get those grades in energy scorecards. This is a, a scorecard, what we call this page, and this is now looking at a single property. Uh, it, because it's getting a D, that tells me that it's in sort of the worst 25% of similar properties. Um, and the, uh, if you scan down the grades, um, you can also see, well, okay, the D tells me this might be a good opportunity to do something at this property. What should we do? Well, if I look down the list, I can see that the property is getting a D on this area that says uh, electric baseload in the common area, which means your, your common area electricity for things like lighting, ventilation, appliances is well above average and looks like a, not only is it inefficient, but the bars tell me that it's in high area of spending. So this is similar to the analysis we did at the portfolio level, uh, but now for one property to zoom in and figure out where, where are my best potential returns from actions at this property. Prioritizing is really important because, you know, real estate owners of both affordable and market rate are, are busy people and they're, they're busy um, making sure their residents are, are, are happy and have a good, good place to live, taking care of um, compliance requirements, making sure the, <laughs> the building is occupied, changing over those apartments. There's a lot, a lot of stuff to worry about besides energy and water, and so prioritization becomes super important. Um, this graphic here shows you that in multifamily buildings, some of the energy use uh, on the right is paid for by the owner, um, some is paid for by the tenant. This graphic is based on a typical New York City building, and we often have central heat and hot water. You can see the blue and the red portions on the left, paid for by the owner. In a, a part of the country where either there wasn't as much heat needed or you had individual hot water heaters and, and heating systems, you could, you could imagine the yellow portion, the tenant portion, would be much larger. Um, and so benchmarking at a whole building level helps you find opportunities for efficiency overall. But being able to break it down by what's owner and what's tenant is also pretty important in understanding whether you're going to get a payback directly out of reduced owner bills, or perhaps in affordable housing you need to document uh, for a housing agency that your residence utility expenses have gone down in order to adjust the utility allowance, for instance. Um, we have several clients who are tracking tenant utility data, um, not only because they're required to by a, a local law, but to allow them to get get credit and get some payback for improvements they're making to the resident units. So one other, you know, portfolio, just a quick other way of applying this prioritization uh, mindset is that um, you can look at the opportunity across a whole portfolio. This is a, another portfolio of affordable housing in California ranked based on energy use per square foot. Um, and so the properties at the right side of the, the graph are either my high performers or they're just the, the properties where the owner is paying a lot of the energy. Um, the yellow bars are properties that are eligible for a program in Southern California uh, that been, we've been really active in in the last couple of years called SoCalREN. Um, they offer incentives both for energy audits and for the upgrades. Um, and so this is a way to see, well, which of my properties are eligible 
um, and which have the best opportunity to generate real energy and water savings. Uh, in this case, you know, for the owner, that was their primary focus. So by overlaying the incentive eligibility with performance, um, you can start to think about rather than approaching opportunities one by one for um, folks that have large portfolios, and this has been a really exciting trend we've seen in the last few years, um, we're moving toward doing upgrades at a portfolio scale. So rather than just find you know, the worst single property, let's look at all the properties that have a decent opportunity and let's say can get a free audit from a local program. And let's look at, at upgrading a whole portfolio at once. Um, I've covered up the, <laughs> the names of the properties here. I put you know, property A in place of the real names, but you can see you know, the opportunity is, is different. It was this property at the top here has sort of the highest net present value for the, uh, the investment that, that we found is, is um, for the measures, uh, energy and water upgrades here and, and properties at the bottom. There are different paybacks for different properties in the portfolio, different life cycle returns, but overall there's a big opportunity across many properties and we can kind of approach that all at once because benchmarking gave us that insight. Uh, the last action I'll see if I can squeeze in here in the last couple of minutes is to uh, implement a near real-time energy management program. I think that near real-time is an important phrase there, um, but it, it's true even though utility bills only come in once a month or in some cases even once every couple months, um, often we do find problems that uh, other folks at, at the site haven't found. Um, this is a property where we actually made a bunch of energy and water upgrades, a, a senior housing building uh, in New York City. Um, this graph is showing me that in the first few months after those upgrades, there were great savings. The uh, green bars are showing me what the baseline was. The dark blue here is what the actual is. So the actual is less than the baseline. We're saving. This little message up here is actually showing me that we are exceeding our projections. All of a sudden, in May of 2015, something happened, and the, inter the water use shot up. What was going on? We got on the phone, <laughs> and we talked to the folks at the property. They said there were no major leaks. Nothing had changed. Um, we actually you know, looked at pictures of the property. We couldn't figure it out. We made a site visit. We couldn't find anything. Eventually, we got a clue, um, and this is sort of a, a, a look to the future here. In New York, we have uh, available hourly data on water consumption from the uh, New York City DEP. And so we could see there that the um, water use in the middle of the night was really high. Um, eventually, we had to go to the property in the middle of the night to figure out what was wrong because no one at the site could, could, could answer it for us. And we found that there were sprinklers that were supposed to run for five or ten minutes every night were running for three hours. Um, so that was a quick fix. Um, and, you know, the, the bad part about this story is it took us a few months to find it, but then we brought it right back down with a quick fix. Um, if it was actually real time, they would have saved more energy here uh, or more water and more money, but um, benchmarking still found that problem. Another example here, a little bit of a better story in the sense that we saw in the benchmarking data a large uh, usage, water usage spike at this property, and then in this case, a quick email to the site staff actually confirmed that they were on top of it. And they knew that there were some problems with the sprinkler system, and they fixed them, and there were some issues with residents, and they were on top of it. So, you know, benchmarking allows you to catch things that sometimes folks on site would have caught, but other times they would have missed, and, and gives you that extra check. Um, so I'll end with just a couple slides to, uh, of research uh, answering the question of whether uh, this stuff is really useful. Can benchmarking really be used? Um, this was a survey of 18 early adopters, uh, affordable housing owners, Right. And then you probably can't see the fine print, but there are different ways that folks were using energy and water benchmarking. Uh, the top two were prioritizing energy projects and troubleshooting building issues. So um, good to see that those are in line with some of the things IMT pointed out, um, although also that there are a number of different issues from marketing to budgeting that folks were doing some of using benchmarking data. Um, a number of studies from EPA, uh, I saw one from Seattle, from various cities that have been doing benchmarking, and our own experience shows that portfolios that are benchmarking tend to save. Um, that's not exactly an experiment, but it is, it is good evidence. Um, the one experiment that I know of is a, a study we did in Minnesota a couple years ago of 550, uh, more than 550 multifamily buildings. Um, we ran it as an experiment, so we actually had a control group for a couple years to see if those folks who had access to benchmarking data did in fact save. 
Um, we found that in the master metered buildings, there was a strong statistically significant savings of about 5% on energy, uh, over 20% on water, um, and there was a third party audit <laughs> of this analysis, so you don't just have to take our word for it. Uh, Center for Energy and Environment up there was our evaluation partner. So um, I think I'll end it there, but uh, thanks to, to uh, Megan and IMT for putting out such a great report and inviting us to join. Thanks, John, and to everyone on the line, I just want to remind you if you have questions to please type them in the chat box and then we will get to them after everyone's presentation. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dimitris. Hello all, and uh, thank you, Megan and IMT, for the invitation uh, for this uh, very interesting discussion today. Um, what we got What we have here at uh, American Utility Management and how we started uh, this whole process for on the energy management, conservation, and benchmarking, uh, we started with uh, just a regular uh, resident billing uh, back to, uh, to apartments where they were renting through our owners. And eventually we evolved into invoice processing, capturing all the data from the invoices. And that was, uh, I would say, 12 or so years ago. And approximately eight or nine years ago, we decided that it's time for us to create actionable items based on the data that was captured through our invoice processing. So uh, the the main uh, the main approach to this is for the client in order to be able to do something with the data that they uh, that comes their way through their invoices and all the utilities is do you have easy access? To those invoices and what do you do with those invoices once they hit your uh, accounts payable? Uh, do you have any way of uh, capturing that data, uh, tabulating, tabulating it into a, into a simple uh, software or solution? Uh, do you analyze the data to be able to find the opportunities? Do you use those opportunities to go out and price out projects and reduce your overall energy expenses? And of course, once you do that, and once you, you get the approval for uh, the actual projects and you get these projects in place, of course, every project comes with uh, some type of payback calculation and some promise of uh, energy savings and uh, cost savings. What do you have in place after the fact to be able to go back and measure the impact of that project? And if the savings that you were promised match uh, actual operation or surpass actual or be a little short of what they were uh, you were promised so uh, there's pretty much three levels of uh, the data capture the data analyze the data and then go back and uh, validate data once uh, you have the projects in place um, we'll spend a little bit of time on uh, uh, the aggregation uh, of the data and what do we do with uh, the data that comes our way I'll give you some numbers uh, as far as what AUM is currently doing. We actually process uh, over 125,000 invoices, utility invoices, every month, and that spans across um, over 4,000 properties throughout the U.S., and those 4,000 properties are approximately 700,000 apartment units. Um, they're not all affordable. Um, I would say the affordable... Um, load of all those uh, properties is approximately 30 to 40 percent. Uh, the remaining is market. Uh, we got student housing and military, uh, but everything has to do with multifamily and uh, residential uh, properties, high-rise, garden-style, mid-rises, pretty much in urban, suburban, and uh, any area of the country. So bringing in the invoices through multiple uh, sources, and I'm not going to try to uh, uh, to pretty much duplicate what Jonathan was saying, the, the, the data coming in, it's, it comes through several sources, several ways. Um, uh, you need to be chasing some of it. Um, utilities are not the easiest partner when it comes to uh, providing the data and actually backing their data. So uh, we have ways of getting data either through uh, uh, going through EDI directly from the utility or going through some services that they actually provide data from several suppliers for several utility 
um, actually looking at some of the invoices and actually capturing the data manually, uh, harvesting data from uh, the screen. Uh, we have uh, logins and uh, passwords for all the accounts that we're dealing with, so that way, uh, if we do have some missing invoices, which unfortunately they do occur more than we would like to, we have to go out and get those missing invoices. And it's not just for uh, financial purposes, which of course is the most important to avoid late fees and everything else that come with it, but also if we have some issues at the property, we need to know what's going on. Of course, uh, the, uh, the utilities, because they have come, uh, cut down on their uh, manpower, Unfortunately, you get a lot of estimated readings, so we have to make sure that the estimated readings are along the trend of uh, what the data should be, and then we work on that to make sure that uh, what the client is paying is not going to come later on and either overpay by a substantial amount or underpay and then get a true up later on that will blow their budgets or uh, create some financial headaches down the, down the list. Then, of course, all that data that comes in, and a lot of data, it's averaging approximately 60 to 70 line items per invoice. So you multiply that by 125,000 invoices, and we're getting into the million line items every month. We store the data on a secure, scalable platform to be able to access uh, the data quickly and uh, reliably. And then we validate data against the historicals, which is more of like a trend analysis, and make sure that... Uh, what you paid prior period and prior year, same period, is in line with what you're paying now and what you're actually using. So all that stuff uh, comes through. We, on the energy side, we standardize uh, the data, uh, the, the data that comes in in the sense of, uh, if, uh, especially for natural gas, it comes in in cubic feet, 100 cubic feet, 1,000 cubic feet, BTUs, MMBTUs. We have to bring all that and convert it into a common uh, unit, which, of course, in gas, uh, it can either be an MMBTU or a therm. Um, and then uh, on the, uh, the electricity is the easiest because uh, we tend to get uh, the absolute majority of the invoices in KWH and then the demand in KW. So that's one of the easiest uh, uh, utilities to actually uh, capture the usage data. And then, of course, on the water side, it comes in multiple, uh, again, readings, and the multipliers on the readings can also uh, range by 10, 100, 1,000. Uh, you can capture in gallons, in liters, in, uh, in cubic feet, in 100 cubic feet. Again, it's all across the board. Then as far as uh, the charges coming in, we group them into uh, the categories. It can be usage charge, rate charge, taxes. Uh, if it's gas electric, if you have dual invoices coming in, uh, several utilities such as Con Ed um, in New York, uh, PG&E on the West Coast, uh, they have electric and gas on the same invoice. We have to separate those and make sure that we capture the correct data uh, from either side to be able to uh, designate it to the proper meter and make sure that uh, we follow through. Then, of course, the property, where is it located, the region is located in, that plays a very big role in the weather data that we allocate to a particular building, and then, of course, uh, who's the property ownership because uh, we would like to uh, put it into portfolios that we can actually compare uh, properties within certain portfolios and then uh, provide portfolio um, uh, reporting so you can see what your entire group of properties is doing at a certain time, and then, of course, compare it across the board across all the properties that we're serving to uh, make sure that depending on the type of property, garden style, um, uh, high rise, mid rise, or the type of metering that's on site, if you have a uh, master meter on the electric or gas, or you have individual metering uh, on electric and gas uh, inside the building, which is uh, more common than master, uh, especially on the newer properties. Uh, when it comes to water, the absolute majority of the properties is master metered, which makes it easier for benchmarking. But of course, uh, that's where our uh, billing services come in because we need to, uh, the, re the clients would like to recover some of that cost back from the residents, and then that's where the billing side comes in. Now we're going to, the next slide, we'll start getting into the analytics 
Um, the screens you see uh, on you are taken from our system. We have developed the software for um, the dashboards, and we do have uh, a benchmarking tool that's uh, similar to uh, Bright Power's benchmarking tool. Um, we use the uh, uh, we use the same thing that any uh, portfolio manager is using as far as the one to hundred scale. But actually, what we can do with our system is we can actually uh, take the type of property and compare it to similar properties. So sometimes you get a score for just your common areas if that's all your building is uh, is uh, reporting on a regular uh, basis, or you can get on the whole building if it's a complete building uh, measure on the gas, electric, and water. So the energy dashboards, uh, you review usage, cost, and weather trends. It's all in one screen, uh, water, uh, energy, and cost. And then, of course, you get your comparables from uh, prior year uh, or same year and um, where the property is above or below uh, certain uh, thresholds that we have placed in place. Uh, Bright Power brought up a number of 75 gallons per uh, bedroom. Um, another, another one is uh, between 115 or 120 gallons per apartment. If you uh, maximize, if you spread that across properties, those are numbers that they're flying around in the industry that uh, they actually create a base of where you can actually have projects for conservation to, uh, that actually uh, make sense to spend money and get some uh, uh, retrofit projects going to conserve. On the energy side, we start seeing uh, uh, individual metered properties that are totally individual metered and the residents are paying for the entire thing. Anything that's above 10 MMBTU per uh, apartment annually, uh, we tend to see uh, that we have some uh, substantial projects going on. When you're talking about partial master where you actually have central domestic water heating but your electricity is uh, submitted at the apartment level, anything that starts getting creeping up above 25 MMBTU or so per apartment per year, we start looking a little more into it as far as the target goes. And um, when it comes to mastered meter buildings, which we don't have that many on the, on the energy side, but uh, there are a few, especially older properties, high rises, or even some gardens. If we start creeping above 50 or 60 MMBTU per apartment per day, uh, then we definitely have some issues on the side and they tend to be on the heating or cooling side of the property. Um, so those are some of the bases we're using for our benchmarking uh, to be able to, to, uh, to compare properties to each other. Uh, looking further into uh, the actual analytics and the benchmarking, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, energy uh, performance dashboard, uh, this is from a single property. So when we start seeing uh, on your left-hand side, when you start seeing uh, those uh, hikes on the uh, on the left-hand side for the water usage, uh, that appears to be an irrigation issue uh, because of uh, the period that uh, we're seeing um, the actual usage. It's the July-August uh, period. And, of course, we've seen some um, increase in usage for, that, for this particular property starting with uh, um, our uh, April-May. This could all be irrigation, but in this particular case, it was actually occupancy. That was a, a property that was lower occupancy than normal uh, prior to the spring. And then once spring came in and the apartments started filling up, of course, you start seeing the spike, but then you also the additional spike during the summer. Um, we tend to uh, circle this for our clients and provide them with feedback and tell them that you need to pay extra attention to this. Of course, depending on the services that they're getting from us, we can provide them additional services. Um, then we have the, the combined cost right here in the middle uh, where you're actually seeing uh, electric, gas, and water all combined. And then, of course, on the right-hand side, you see the energy dashboard. In this particular case, as you can tell also from the cost from the middle uh, graph, uh, we, had a, we have a spike on the electric uh, a very large spike in a period where we, we wouldn't expect such a spike um, and working further with a utility to find out what happened is it was a billing error in a sense because they were estimating, estimating and all of a sudden they got a real bill that was of course uh, much higher so it was a low estimate 
uh, and then all of a sudden the real uh, usage came in and it spiked. If the client was not expecting this, it could have been a big uh, blow for their budgets. Um, in the middle, uh, we're seeing uh, below on the right, on the left hand side, we're seeing all the numbers uh, for the water side uh, because. Um, in this particular case, uh, we're saying 120 gallons per apartment per day for a garden-style property. Uh, the line, the red lines on all graphs, when it has to do with the usage of water, it's actually that benchmark. It's similar to what uh, Bright Power was putting on, on the graph as far as the 75 gallons per, uh, per bed. On the energy side, uh, we also have uh, uh, the, the red line up here on uh, where we, we say that that's where the base load is, where we're seeing uh, the uh, electricity being fairly flat across, and that's for your lighting, that's for your uh, elevators, stuff that's uh, not really based on weather. And then the remaining is for uh, either air conditioning or some heating load. Going, uh, the main thing is, uh, we're going through all the invoices and we try to provide our clients with a rate analysis to make sure that they're on the right rates, uh, they don't pay taxes. There are many areas in the United States, um, example, uh, Massachusetts, D.C., New York, where you should not be paying uh, state taxes if, uh, for, for uh, utilities when it comes to residential use and multifamily, of course, is residential. Uh, then we're assisting our clients with uh, commodity procurement in all the deregulated areas to bring down costs substantially. Uh, energy conservation projects, uh, that's where we identify opportunities based on usage and cost. And the rates and the usage, of course, play an important role in the payback. And we provide our clients with paybacks to be able to, to get projects going. Uh, some examples of those are on your uh, right-hand side of uh, where the graphs are where we're actually uh, providing some actual savings for a client based on the rate and invoice analysis that we have provided, and also some uh, guidance of um, our clients as far as what the project cost will be. And uh, those are for water expense savings for a water retrofit uh, project. Of course, resident building recovery. Um, <clears throat> if a resident knows what they're using, and that's if you have submitters inside the units, um, they tend to use less. Um, uh, knowledge tends to drive conservation. That's not always the case, but we have found uh, we have found out over the years that the more involved the resident is with the utility uh, uh, expense of a property, they tend to use a little less. Um, then we have tracking of the results. Uh, the conservation projects. Uh, the top graph shows. Uh, forecast, actual, and historical. The historical is before we, if we didn't touch the property, what would have happened? Um, the forecast is based what we projected based on the project that we're going to put in place, and then the green line is where the actual usage is based on the project. This is from an actual uh, project that we completed for a client of ours. Uh, of course, you have the GRESP reporting, which is more of a sustainability reporting. It has become very uh, popular in the United States uh, over the last few years, especially now that the Green Building Council has uh, purchased uh, the GRESP reporting. It's very popular in uh, Europe. Uh, a large percentage of properties in Europe are using GRESP. Of course, you have the EPA Energy Star reporting, which has been uh, around for a long time. I was involved with the development of uh, the EPA Energy Star uh, score for the actual commercial buildings. That was in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I've been working with uh, the EPA, supporting them uh, through the, uh, uh, the creation of the new multifamily. And now we're working with them for the water um, uh, energy star reporting. Uh, of course, you have the sustainability measures based on, uh, and it doesn't just stop on, uh, uh, on uh, energy and water conservation. There's a lot more involved in sustainability as far as uh, corporate mindset how much the residents are involved and everything else that comes with it. And then, of course, you have the client scorecards, which actually provide a client with uh, what their properties are doing, how they're comparing to uh, each other within the portfolio, and how they're compared to the industry overall. And I'm sorry for going too fast. I'm just uh, trying to uh, make up for the time a little bit. Um, if you're not using your data 
for uh, for uh, uh, analyzing and finding uh, issues with uh, the property. Uh, the correction could be as easy as changing some operation uh, structure, and that could be at a very low cost, or it could be as uh, as involved as replacing entire boiler rooms, chiller rooms, uh, and or entire lighting. Uh, projects and water retrofit projects in the property. Um, we provide end-to-end -end, uh, turnkey solutions for our clients. We actually identify, we um, audit, we uh, do the project, and then we validate the results after the fact. And um, our number one focus is uh, multifamily. And of course, affordable is a major part of, uh, of uh, the multifamily industry. Um, this is the end of the presentation, and I know I went too fast. I'm available for questions, and then anybody that has any particular questions, they can send me an email, and I'll be more than glad to reply on any specific uh, uh, items. So, Megan, it's all yours. All right. Thank you so much. I'm just going to uh, try and change it over to the slide with all of our contact information. Let's see. Whoops. Okay, and then we had a couple of questions that I wanted to ask. This is open to both of you. Are you under contract to to ensure that you're providing continued savings for your clients? Um, is this question for whom? I think it's open to both of you. Uh, are you under um, contract to ensure continued savings? Yes. Uh, well, when we provide um, and. Uh, I'll say it on the AUM side, when we provide some projected savings for a particular client, um, we stand behind those savings and uh, using, having the benefit of seeing the invoices coming in every month and collecting the data, we provide the client with uh, the feedback they need to prove those savings. Now, uh, there's different types of contracts that we can offer to the client. Uh, I believe what it's meant by this question is a shared savings, meaning that or a guaranteed savings uh, contract, which of course carries some type of liability because we're not on the side to actually control um, uh, a property's operation. Uh, but uh, yes, we can provide uh, this type of project uh, to a client. Yeah, and similarly for Bright Power, we um, we do sometimes enter into shared savings or uh, energy savings agreements. Um, for projects where we are contractually guaranteeing savings or, or have some stake in it. Um, but for all of our clients that we're tracking long term and doing different upgrade projects, um, we're very much, you know, stake our, our reputation and our, our relationship with you on the fact that you can trust that the results are going to come through or if unexpected things happen that we're there to come in and, and troubleshoot and be with you. Uh, we see this as kind of a long term relationship with our clients. So we, we want to be there long term and, and that you can rely on us. Great, thank you. And this is also open up, to, open to both of you. Um, so, in terms of thinking about scale, or if I'm an affordable housing owner, is there a scale in which it makes sense to contract with one of you? Do you only work with a certain size building type, or do you also, you know, do you work with small building owners as well as large building owners in the affordable housing sector? Uh, Jonathan, you want to take this, or you want me to go first? Yeah, I mean, we work we work with the whole range <laughs> of building sizes and portfolio sizes. I would say, um, you know, our typical clients are buildings are probably in the range of, um, you know, 40 to two or 300 units. Um, but we work with smaller and larger properties um, in terms of portfolios. Also, everywhere from one to more than 300 properties in the portfolios that we're working with. So I, I don't know if I, I have a particular cutoff. I think clearly um, there is a, a greater payback potential for the, the kind of startup costs when you have a larger portfolio or a larger property. Um, but, you know, so you, but you have to make that judgment yourself based on your energy expenses and the size of your team. There, there could be a small portfolio where um, they just don't have the in-house time to deal with it on their, on, by themselves and, and, or, or need some additional expertise where we'd be happy to work with you. Yeah, and, and along the same lines, uh, we got 
uh, based on portfolio size. We're basing our pricing on portfolio size, not on property size. We have portfolios that they could have 300 properties and they could, their property could range from five units to 350, 400 units. Um, of course, there is the economies of scale. Um, when you have uh, 10 or 20, uh, five or 10 unit properties, uh, we can more, we'll be more than glad to offer you uh, uh, services on the energy management side. It's just that uh, the related cost might be uh, prohibitive. Um, again, it, it's all what can be uh, afforded by the clients and what type of services they want, but we don't have a cutoff on uh, property size either. Great, thank you. And then the last question is for John. Um, someone asked, can you please define fossil fuel baseload, which I think is what you mentioned during your presentation. Yeah, good question. So when we're analyzing both electricity and uh, fossil fuels, meaning gas or heating oil or propane, um, we separate out the seasonal uses, um, heating and cooling, from what we call the base load, which is your year-round uh, energy use. So for the fossil fuel side, um, typically the, the fossil fuel base load would be for domestic hot water in a multifamily building. Maybe a little bit of cooking or laundry in there, but mostly domestic hot water. Great, thank you. And with that, we are right on time. And so I'm going to uh, wrap it up here. And just want to thank John and Dimitris, uh, along with Bright Power and AUM, for participating today in this webinar series. We will, we have recorded this and we'll be posting this on our website through our YouTube channel. And I'd like to invite you all to also join in on the last webinar, which will be on December 15th with Community Preservation Corporation. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks.